So welcome to Breakfast with the Chiefs. Um, before we get started, I do want to quickly remind people who have not been to this facility before uh, how the Q&A works. Um, you'll find that there are mics in front of you and um, if you push the button, the mic will turn red. It'll be a solid red. If it's a solid red, you have the floor. If it's a flashing red, you are in the queue. And sometimes the queue will be so large it'll do nothing. Uh, so you just have to wait. Um, so that's again how it'll work. So uh, it, it is a packed house. So again, maybe even also make yourself known if you have the, the, uh, the solid red light. Um, I would also like to acknowledge uh, uh, the sponsors who have made this morning possible. Uh, All Scripts has uh, helped out this morning. Um, and uh, from Bayshore, uh, Janet Danglish is here, I believe. Uh, uh, Carol Fancott from uh, Canadian Foundation of Healthcare Improvement is here this morning. Uh, Vanessa Perry from Deloitte uh, is also here, and uh, uh, Cynthia Atlantis, uh, I think, is here from HealthPro. Uh, Hiroc, Michelle Holden is here this morning, and uh, Brent McGaw, who recently joined uh, Maximus Canada, is here this morning, and then uh, Bernie Sush is uh, way up in the back corner there from Medtronic, has helped out with this morning's event. And again, without the support of Sick Kids, uh, we wouldn't be able to do uh, this morning's event. So a, a big round of applause to all our supporters. Thank you very much. Uh, nobody is here to see me, so uh, let's get started and uh, we'll go to Will Falk. Hey, and welcome. Um, nice to see so many smiling faces bright and early after a Raptors loss. <laughs> I was at the game. The only good news is I have tickets for game five. So um, we are, uh, the, the premise of this morning is a fairly simple one. Uh, we have two excellent CEOs from Ontario who have both been CEOs in major organizations in British Columbia. So uh, Dr. Brendan Carr, who's an emergency room physician, was CEO of Island Health, uh, or Vancouver Island Health Authority, as it was previously known to some of us. Uh, and Arden Crystal, uh, who's a, 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 an oncology nurse uh, by training and um, uh, was CEO of both Fraser uh, Valley Health and then later the Provincial Health Services Authority, which is the uh, agency that uh, runs big portions of centralized infrastructure in British Columbia. And the premise for today is that um, the Western Canada went through regionalization uh, 15, 20 years ago, and the, of the four Western provinces, for a variety of reasons, British Columbia is the one that probably has the most lessons for Ontario at this point. Um, relative to Saskatchewan and Manitoba, uh, British Columbia is more nearly at the same scale as Ontario, um, and also some of the regions, particularly in Saskatchewan, were, were much, much smaller. And Alberta is just such a special case that we don't really want to talk about Alberta because <laughs> they never seem to finish restructuring. And I think we're all hoping that while there may be some bumps along the way, that we will actually get to a point where we have integrated care delivery. So I'm going to get out of the way and let Brendan first talk about uh, the health authority level, and then Arden's going to talk a little bit about what the central agency looks like, and then I'm going to facilitate some questions with the idea to try to think about what some of the lessons may be for uh, us in Ontario as we're thinking about the formulation of health teams, putting together a central agency, and some of the other items on the agenda. In defense of our two speakers today, I do want to just say one thing. Um, and this is in part to ask you not to give long speeches when you ask your questions, but also in part just to say that they're not now nor are in any way representing the provincial government here today. Um, and so, um, you know, let, let, let's have a discussion about how we get to the shared objectives we have rather than uh, uh, speechifying. Um, hopefully that's a helpful thing to say. Anyway, we're live tweeting on hashtag BWTC, and you see some uh, other uh, Twitter stuff up there if you want. And so without further ado, I'm going to go to Brendan Carr. Great. 
Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's really a, a pleasure to be here with everyone. And Artie and I were just chatting that it was about six months ago when uh, when they approached us and said, you know, do you think the two of you would be interested in doing something? And so we we just want to say, right for the record, we know all of you are here just because of it's Arden and I here today. It has nothing to do <laughs> with what's going on in the health system and maybe what has intervened in the last six months. Uh, anyway, uh, good timing. So congratulations to Longwoods uh, for uh, for this. But anyway, it's a real it's a it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, we, I think our, our intention is to spend just a few minutes at the top um, describing maybe some of the things that we think are lessons, but we really would like to get into some dialogue and, and some questions. We're going to go light on, on trying to just to give you a lot of, um, of, uh, of an explanation of the system, assuming that you might know or if, you, if there are particular questions that you have, you can ask them or you can approach us afterwards. But I'm going to start with uh, from, the, from the perspective of a regional authority. And I think uh, our comments are meant to be observations, not judgments. And uh, I think most of the comments I'm going to make are probably uh, also true, not just of British Columbia, but of many of the other regional systems in the country. Uh, the BC system, as Will said, is a, is a highly integrated system in, in the sense that most of the services are actually part of, and so it does, it does meet the single organization, single governance, single funding envelope criteria of the OHT, and so it is a, it is a very relevant kind of uh, thing to look at. What's, what is important to note off the top is that within BC, like most other provinces, uh, primary care is not part of that organization, and so there is a, so so the so the dynamics between primary care and the, and the regional authority are extremely relevant in terms of kind of getting at stuff. I think in terms of key learnings, um, the I think the first thing I would say is that um, most regional systems in the country have been planned at a population threshold of about a million people. And for purposes of thinking about regional services, and uh, that, that, that makes an awful lot of sense. I think many of them have, under, have come to realize that the, while that makes sense from, from the perspective of regional planning, from the point of view of ser delivering services, a million population doesn't make any sense. And so most of them you see have, have, have evolved into some kind of a geographic or uh, you know, some other kind of metric around uh, where at the service level or, or the population level at which we, we deliver services. And so I think that's an important thing. Uh, and it just underscores the notion that in healthcare, geography really matters, the local assets, the local issues, um, those things all really fundamentally uh, have an impact. And so distinguishing between those two kind of levels of, of planning is really important. I, I think uh, certainly uh, the, the evidence would show that in an organization where you have aligned funding, when you've aligned incentives, where you've aligned accountability and governance, that that can go a long way to deal with a lot of the issues that we're facing in Ontario. So as I think back to my time in BC, uh, we spent, we, we, we might have had some issues with uh, hallway medicine from time to time. We certainly dealt with issues of surge and things like that. But um, we, we inherently had the ability, though, to kind of optimize our system year over year. And quite frankly, those conversations happened at the senior operational leadership level much more than they would have at the level of the board and the senior leadership team of, of the regional authority. Uh, and, you know, it happened over time, but there was certainly a, a, an opportunity. We certainly saw, I think, a huge impact in terms of a system that was right size in terms of you know the, the the different component parts that you needed to kind of just optimize flow and things like that. Um, I think the 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 other side of that coin though is 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 equally important, which is simply keep creating a governance and an organi organization structure that creates uh, that 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 is prone to integration. Integration is not the same thing as actually creating integration, and so it's it's the other side of that coin is that. Creating the structure is really just the starting point, and I think every system in Canada, and certainly in BC, would, you know, has lived through um, what is really the process of trying to actually create effective integration at the community level uh, within that structure. So you start with alignment in terms of the structure with goals, but, the, but that's really where the heavy lifting starts. And the heavy lifting oftentimes is really about unpacking what organizations have been doing, what their, their, what their focus has been, trying to kind of galvanize around where it is as a system you're trying to get to, and really sort of getting people to focus on get, moving to that different direction. It requires a completely different skill set from a leadership point of view. Um, the, the skills that we, we use in large, um, complex organizations to plan and, and organize and, and, and execute interventions are very different than the kind of skills that you need working in a community with a vast array of, 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 of partners. Um, 
And fundamentally, it comes down to building relationships and trust. And there is uh, there's an evolutionary kind of uh, flavor to it that it's hard to it's hard to force. Like it really does require time. Uh, so that's I think that's a key that's a key learning. Um, part of that would be um, the the issue of primary care. And I think most organizations have found that uh, while it it, it you can. Um, uh, quite effectively manage uh, some of the hard resources that that you know like like you know how many acute care beds you have long term care beds you know how much uh, home care capacity you have, but when it comes down to understanding how you can really make create interventions that are going to impact patient populations, it's really challenging to do that without primary care fully in. And in BC, uh, they, there's a complicated sort of structure around primary care that's very different than the Ontario model. But suffice it to say, in that there was a, I would say the experience would be that there's a, there was a lot of variability. In, in some cases, some of the primary care divisions, as they're called, were very much leaders in this kind of change. And we saw huge, huge strides in terms of really having interventions that had huge impact on patient clusters, priority patient populations, things like that. And other examples where we just couldn't kind of, where we just kind of kept getting wrapped around the axle and we couldn't see a lot of change. Um, I think the, that leads to, I think, the most effective integration efforts across the country and regional authorities have been integration efforts where there's been clarity around what's the population that we're trying to have an impact on. And I'm not talking about the macro population, but I'm talking about um, are there subpopulations within the population that we, want, that we need to bring focus to? Do we understand clearly what it is that we're trying to achieve differently? And then what's going to be required to get there? There have been a lot of integration efforts that have just really been about creating integration. And creating integration actually doesn't usually uh, result in a lot of change. It, it, it takes a lot of effort. It creates something that looks and feels very different, but it's not necessarily effective unless you bring focus to it in terms of what is it that we're trying to achieve through this integration and, and usually having some kind of focus on priority populations or something, you know, like whether it's yeah, patient types or market segments, things like that is really, really important. Um, the last thing I'm going to say is just to say you, we should also take, you know, we should expect some significant shifts um, as leaders and as organizations as we go down this pathway. And I think in, in BC, certainly, like, it starts with shifts like um, um, the, the mature regions uh, in BC, like, from the point of view of, of long term care services, that we probably had a ratio of two thirds and a third, where two thirds of our long term care services were provided by a third party. About a third might have been provided by organization. Home care, even more densely uh, provided by uh, community partners. That kind of shift is just a natural uh, uh, shift, and it, and it actually makes sense from a, from a resource point of view, from a business point of view. Um, with it, though, then comes a different focus for the regional authority around how you ensure quality uh, in, in, a, um, in an outreach or third party system. Uh, the whole issue of contract management takes on a different sort of order of magnitude. So the organization that I led, our annual budget was about $2.3 billion. About $750 million of that was, was, was directly contracted. And so your organization's facility to be basically managing that and, and managing it from the point of view of quality is, a, is at a different order of magnitude than a lot of what we would, we would kind of do. I think um, your leadership structure changes. The work that leaders are, do changes dramatically uh, in these structures. Uh, and you see changes in terms of um, the distribution of um, the administrative or overhead type resources that we have in our system. So uh, away from kind of a lot of structure, or, uh, which I think in Ontario in a highly fragmented system we have a lot of structural resources into resources that are more, much more involved in planning, in facilitating engagement at the community level, in uh, understanding data and analytics that actually help to inform decision making, which is really a good thing. You see quite an evolution in that regard. Um, and I think the last thing yeah, that, I, that I wanted to raise was just the primary care piece, but I think I spoke to that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. Thanks. Okay, so first of all, I want to preface my comments by saying that, that Will very kindly gave me two promotions in BC. Uh, <laughs> I was a vice president at Fraser Health and I was the chief operating officer at PHSA. So uh, um, it would have been nice to have had those positions, but anyway, thank you. Um, 
So uh, I'm going to speak specifically about uh, the centralized agency uh, PHSA, uh, otherwise known as Provincial Health Services Authority. That was my last uh, position in BC. And, and I think it's relevant today because of um, some of the work that's happening in Ontario around the creation of a central agency, Ontario Health. Uh, there are several lessons around uh, the way that PHSA was formed and ended up evolving uh, that I think uh, are really relevant uh, for the work that's happening in Ontario right now. Um, right now, I would say just to, off the top that one of the key differences and my suggestion would be based on my experience to keep it different is that Ontario is starting uh, with a number of agencies coming together that have very distinct uh, planning, coordinating and commissioning roles, but they do not have roles in delivery. And so there is, a, I think, an important distinction there and I want to just talk to you a little bit about some of my experience at PHSA and how that could, that can create some challenges in the way that you operationalize the agency. Uh, PHSA is comprised of, and, and in 2001, was, uh, was uh, developed um, a, a somewhat through strategy and somewhat through what's left at the end when we've created regional health authorities. Mm -hmm. So there were some big standalone agencies such as BC Children's Hospital and the BC Cancer Agency and there was a perception at the time, I remember it well because I was there in the province, that uh, if you afforded those agencies, which, uh, which predominantly landed in Vancouver, that Vancouver Coastal Health would be so gargantuan and would be so powerful that there would be a huge inequity with the other regions. And so one of the reasons that they separated them out uh, was primarily they had a provincial mandate, so it made sense for them to come together, but also they wanted to try and create a little bit of equalization uh, at the table when you know, these, these relatively small number, I think about it, for a whole province, uh, there's six CEOs that essentially run all of the health services, including public health, in the province. And so uh, those kinds of power differentials were important at the time when you were trying to iterate and you were trying to figure out how to, you know, share the, the, the global pot of money. Um, so one of the challenges I think that PHSA has been living with ever since 2001 was that some of the members, uh, the affiliate members of the agencies were reasonably happy to be part of the whole authority and some of them have been reasonably unhappy to be part of the authority. And I think that some of those same things still exist today in some of those agencies. Um, and uh, I, I don't have the magic answer for how to make that better. I would say that uh, one of the things that um, that I would say as a positive for all agencies that have joined PHSA it is the amount of back office support uh, that can be provided to agencies big or small. So, you know, what we saw in BC was that there were relatively small agencies, but they had pretty important provincial mandates. Uh, BC Center for Disease Control, for example, has a very, very important provincial mandate but a reasonably small budget, like 60, 70 million, right? Compared to the big budgets of the BC Cancer Agency and BC Children's Hospital. And so um, it, it, the, the, the back office support, if you will, that a consolidated central agency can provide to that agency, I think has been fairly helpful. Um, and not to mention the cross-pollination that's happened with some of these agencies, in particular some of the uh, cancer prevention activities that both BCCDC and the Cancer Agency partnered with. And some of that partnership, I believe, be, uh, became somewhat easier under that model. Um, I spoke earlier about some of the challenges with having commissioning and delivery in the same kind of bundle, and I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, certainly, uh, when I worked at a regional health authority like Brendan, I think one of the, the, the rubs or pinches, if you will, between the central agency and the regional agencies were that 
you know, if you're getting the, the funding bundle uh, to commission cancer services, but you're delivering a big portion of those, it uh, feels like there's have and have nots, right? So uh, clearly you're going to make sure that your budget is okay, uh, and then the rest over, the leftovers, will be commissioned to the small chemotherapy clinics across the province, etc. And, and and to be fair, I, I think that, um, that that some of that was perception and some of that was true, and and that does create some challenges just in terms of relationship and trust. And so um, you know, right now, what I see in Ontario is no move toward that sort of combining delivery and commissioning, and and I would approve of that given my experience in BC. Um, a, a couple other things, uh, I would say that. Um, particularly in, in PHSA, uh, I think um, the, the, the missing ingredient and the ingredient that works in some of the areas is, is, a, is collaboration and relationship. And I know that we consider those to be somewhat soft skills. The reality is, <clears throat> is that I think that the structure uh, it, it isn't particularly um, problematic, but I think that at times the relationship becomes problematic. And uh, my observation is, is that um, uh, keeping uh, clinical agencies who are commissioning work and who have deep, deep expertise in, in their particular field, giving the autonomy, give them the autonomy and leaving them with the autonomy under the umbrella of a central agency is a, is a recipe for success just in terms of trying to build that relationship uh, um, in, a, in a stronger way. I think that the kinds of things that a central agency can truly bring are some economies of scale, some incredible back office uh, um, uh, depth uh, in terms of analytics, uh, finance, consolidated payroll. There's a number of things that right now uh, smaller agencies probably spend a disproportionate amount of money on which you could consolidate and actually support them in a better way. Uh, but I do think that, uh, that uh, expecting a central agency and one CEO to be the expert of all things is not a reasonable expectation. And I think the CEO who comes in and sees that as an opportunity to simply make those agencies stronger, I think, will be successful. Um, I, I want to say one thing, and this is a, 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 a kind of a, a, a current issue that we're struggling with right now. Certainly uh, at Southlake a couple of weeks ago, we had a measles uh, case come in. One of the struggles that I had, notwithstanding the fact that York Region Public Health were, were great people, but it, it, there is a fairly disjointed response to those kinds of things in Ontario right now. I want to give you an example of um, a measles case that happened in BC and how that happened in the summer. Uh, a person uh, came in through uh, Vancouver Airport, was a Fraser Health resident, went home to Fraser Health, uh, uh, made several contacts along the way, uh, took the ferry to Victoria for a vacation, and so what we had was we had contract tracing that had to span over three health authorities. And so uh, the value of having the BC Center for Disease Control act as the, the point of contact for all of that tracing to work as that sort of key conduit, I think was very, very helpful. And I think, uh, I know that public health right now isn't part of this discussion about OHTs in a central agency. I just wanted to use that as a representative example of how you can achieve some of that provincial integration without necessarily de delving into delivery and how you can make that work for you. I think maybe I'll stop there at this point and we can go to questions. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to start off with a couple and then go to the audience. So if folks want to queue up, please feel free. Um, you, both, you both mentioned size and scale. Uh, Ontario, <coughs> the announced policy is to target health teams at a 300,000 population size. Um, and of course, the provincial agency is going to be about two and a half, three times BC. How do you feel about those scale choices? Is 300,000 the right size? 
Well, if I may start, um, when I worked at Fraser Health, uh, my portfolio included 13 hospitals across a very, very broad geography. The smallest hospital was a 20-bed hospital in Hope, BC, and the largest uh, was Surrey Memorial, which has about 700 some odd beds and serving very urban population. Uh, I also had all of public health services all the way from Hope to Burnaby. Um, the, the challenge with that size and scale is, is that the local needs in a small town like Hope that has a very high Aboriginal population versus Surrey or New Westminster where Royal Columbian plays a very tertiary quaternary role are very, very different. And so I personally am quite excited about the smaller uh, scale hubs, if you want to call them. I think that there's, that's where the community uh, relationships uh, grow and prosper. And I think if there is one thing that, that happens uh, perhaps haphazardly in BC, depending on the community, is that kind of community consolidation. So, so, I th so you end up breaking it down anyway. So, do. Now, Brendan, you, you, your organization in, in Ontario, Osler, has spent a lot of time putting together something that's a lot bigger than 300,000. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how do you feel about it? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think the number 300,000 is pretty arbitrary. Um, and um, my advice would be, um, you know, understand your population, understand what makes sense from a scale point of view, and be prepared to, I think, make uh, a proposal that is, you know, the most reasonable proposal you can make around what that looks like. And, but as I think I kind of hinted earlier, I, I, you know, I, I would distinguish between the macro structure of an organization, which we might call an OHT, and the operational units. And I, I think in many communities, 300,000 might make sense from an operational point of view, but there's lots of rural areas where it, it will make no sense at all. And so you just, there, there's, you just have to be, have the flexibility to sort of say what really makes sense uh, in our geography and with, you know, in terms of our community. So, yeah. Yeah, and I also think if you're, if you're a big mid-sized city, you know, like the size of say London or, you know, the the thought of having to break that up into multiple OHTs Doesn't just to sense. meet the three hundred thousand mark. I'm yeah. not sure that makes sense. So, so, so it raises the question: How do you think the OHTs will relate to the municipalities? You, know, you talked a little bit about public health. Yeah. You know, in parts of the province, we're seeing ambulance systems shifting from fire over to health. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I retirement think, homes. I, I think that this will actually be probably the more important dynamic that we. We'll need to be kind of uh, tuning ourselves to um, and from the point of view of if what we're really trying to do is create a system that is going to uh, be more effective at integrating both health services and social services then municipal levels of organization probably become far more relevant and so I, that, I, I think that that's actually a very good starting point to be thinking about in terms of what makes sense as we've looked at like the 1.2 or 3 million kind of you know residents in the area that we serve um, we looked at that geographically in terms of where there might be 300,000-ish populations. But when you look at things like where are the social services, who are the main providers of community services, uh, there's, there's a high degree of overlap in all, all of the different sub-geographies. So in a way, it doesn't make sense to create three distinct entities necessarily. It probably makes more sense to have sort of one, you know, those relationships, but operate them in kind of different zones or geographies. Yeah, yeah I, I think that relationship with municipalities is key, and I've, I, I, I think it's key no matter what province you're in. Um, and again, it comes down to those work units. If we think about where work really happens, uh, on the ground, those kinds of relationships are necessary and they're already in place to a degree among our providers. I think where we sometimes lose it is that once we get a little bit higher up the chain, we aren't necessarily as connected as yeah. we need to be. So, for example, one of the things that I do is, is I meet with the, the six or seven mayors that are mayors of the towns and the jurisdictions we serve on a regular basis, just to talk about areas of overlap and, and even what their role is in creating healthy communities. Municipalities, boards of education, children's aid societies all have their own geographies um, and they have their own funding streams. Mm -hmm. Many of them vary based on the tax raising ability of the area. Um, how, how do you see the overall funding 
Uh, well, first off, how did the overall funding work or not work in British Columbia? And what, what, do, you, what do you preview? How, how do you think it's going to work uh, for Ontario health teams? Uh, uh, so, so one of the, um, I would say, challenging elements of the integrated model in BC is, is the funding formula. Mm. Uh, and Brendan, you can sure. agree or disagree, but I, um, so, for example, and this I think created another relationship problem uh, from time to time between the, the super agency and, and the health authorities is that, as we all know, there's only one pot of money. <laughs> And so in BC, uh, PHSA gets their cut off the top, mm -hmm. and then the rest of the pie gets distributed to the health authorities. Um, the challenge with that is that that means that, uh, and when you think about the types of services in that top part of the pie, um, it, you have to reserve a certain amount of money for certain things. Chemotherapy, for example, sometimes there can be fairly big swings in what the costs are from year over year, depending on whether a new drug comes onto the market uh, and becomes part of a care pathway. And so uh, it, those things uh, are, are very difficult in the BC system. One of the most challenging elements, I would say, is that, uh, and I believe it's still the case, but certainly when I worked there, if you ran a surplus, the surplus went back to government. Mm -hmm. And so there wasn't incentive necessarily uh, to do some of the innovative <coughs> efficiency work uh, that you might have wanted to do to be able to reinvest into something else. And, uh, and, and so that, that I think is, is problematic. What I like about um, at least the ideas for OHT and eventually going to some kind of capitated model is that there does, it does create an incentive to try to create more value in the system so that you can reinvest it into frontline care. Can, can I just add one? I, th I totally agree with everything Arden said. If you look at uh, health expenditures in BC on a per capita basis, and if you look at it by LIN uh, boundaries, uh, the average per capita uh, expenditure is about $1,900 uh, per person. And the lowest in, in Ontario is uh, less than half of that, around, around, a thou or around, around 1,000. And the highest per capita is around 3,400 uh, in Ontario. Uh, and so no matter how you try to slice and dice that in terms of um, standardization of the population, uh, you know, sort of this, is, this is based upon, you know, LIN, like, like postal code, not what hospital are we at, but it's like where people live. So there's a, so there's a disparity in Ontario from $1,000 per person per year to $3,400 per person per year, depending upon where you live. Uh, in BC, um, the, the, the dominant funding mechanism was called PINBIF. We have our you know, various acronyms, population-based needs, need, or population needs-based funding. And essentially it was a standardized kind of you know, uh, funding based upon a, a, stand, like a, like a calculation based upon like your population. Yeah. And so, there, so, so the benefit of that was there was much less disparity in terms of what funding was available. And as a result of that, there was much more consistency in terms of the level of services that would be available in a community or in a population. But, but now isn't that then going to end up being problematic a few years out for the ministry? I mean, if, if what you're saying is that there are disparities amongst regions in Ontario and any newly formed OAT gets to move to $2,000 per capita, just for the sake of argument, isn't it obvious that the people who are going to move to that are the people who are below that number right now? Well, if, if, that, if that was the assumption, uh, I think our understanding is that that's not the assumption. That, 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 mm -hmm. uh, and so the problem will not, I don't think it's going to be that. It might be, I so, mean, I think. So how I do think, you do population-based funding with different levels of funding per capita? Well, I'm not, I, I mean, you're, so you, the question is whether or not you do population-based funding. Uh -huh. What I think what we understand is that the, the intention here is to basically take your existing funding envelopes and work with that. The challenge that that's going to create is it, there are still there are still going to be organizations who are going to bring together a thousand dollars per per person per annum, and other organizations that are going to start with thirty four hundred dollars per person per annum, and that and so yep. no matter no matter which way you cut it, eventually 
um, the system is going to have to try to redistribute some of that, those resources. Uh, and how you do that, I don't know, but it's going to have to happen. Well, and my understanding is that the funding model that, that Ontario is contemplating right now will eventually, at maturity, have this risk adjuster to it. So it's not going to simply be, this is the pot you have now and you'll always have this same pot, but that uh, the, the health or the utilization of the population will be considered as one of those risks, which for certain communities um, uh, will naturally increase their envelope, and for other communities it will decrease their envelope. Because remember that um, gain sharing isn't necessarily 100% of the gain going to that particular OHT, but a proportion of the gain would go back to government, and then that's a Ideal, idealistically, that would be the money that they could use to shore up some of these other communities that clearly have higher higher level of need. Okay, and just one more question, and then I'm going to go to the audience. Although, Matt, I will say, I if there are blinking red lights, I don't see them. So I don't know if that's because I'm. Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, so one more question though the uh, the transfer pricing question that you raised. Uh, earlier, that each of you raised earlier, um, uh, Brendan, you, you you said, or you both talked a little bit about commissioning for peds, for mental health, for cancer. Mm -hmm. What lessons would you bring from BC about how you draw lines and boundaries around those services to transfer price them back into, because presumably what's going to happen is those health teams are going to have to go to the center for certain services. How, how, how do you determine, that, who determines that service bundle? So um, can I use an example actually that isn't one of those three, but I'll also speak about those three. So in BC we have a uh, an agency similar to Core Health called Cardiac Services BC. The primary difference is that Cardiac Services BC gets a bundle of funding from the Ministry of Health uh, through PHSA, and they use that to allocate on a quality and volume uh, proportion to the various cardiac centers. So they would be the ones that say you get this many cabbages and you get this many uh, interventional procedures, etc. It has created a, a, a way, and who, who d makes those decisions is essentially a shared governance steering committee that has representation of all of those centers. And so they've come up with objective criteria for how you would allocate funding. And I have actually seen it where when one center cannot meet their volumes or has fallen down in quality standards that they have shifted volumes to another. You could um, presumably, and right now in, in the way that Cancer Care Ontario works, you know, they set standards, they set quality standards, and they allocate funds to the delivery agencies. Not a whole lot different. They do a lot of quality monitoring. Uh, they uh, do, you know, predictive analytics around who's going to need the next PET scanner, those kinds of things. And it allows you sort of to contain the spread and growth uh, in areas where you ought not to spread and grow. And uh, so I would say you could do very similar thing in with kids and, and other things. I think, um, you know, in BC, uh, BC Children's Hospital takes a leadership role uh, with an agency they call, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember what they call, I keep thinking Kids Health Alliance, that's here. Um, uh, in, in, in essence, what they've done is they've created tiers of service. So they don't allocate funds, but what they do is they have a supportive role around rationalizing the province to say, if you're a really small hospital, you know, you shouldn't be doing surgery on kids. Um, that should go to a more regional center where they have a critical mass and where we know that you can do safer, higher quality procedures. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just some of the same kind of organization that could happen here. Totally agree. Okay, go ahead, John. Um, I, I, John King, by the way, I wasn't going to say anything until your opening remarks about Alberta. Um, <laughs> I was actually in Alberta when we did the restructuring. I just want to make a point Which here. Which one? Uh, <laughs> I was, I, you know what? I was there for the first one. So oh, in 1993, okay. Alberta started the restructuring. So that was many years ago. <laughs> but I think the point here that I want to make is the restructuring in other provinces were as much a restructuring as the acute care system as it was to bring in the other parts of the system. Mm -hmm. So for example, in Calgary, we had 
seven acute care hospitals, we went to one. Mm -hmm. And then they went to one regional authority. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge restructuring of the acute care system. I just want to make that point because I think BC, Saskatchewan, Alberta, uh, Manitoba, all the same. What we're doing here is we are doing a voluntary direction here. Mm -hmm. The other provinces, and I'll speak about Alberta, we started voluntary. After about 16 months, it wasn't going to work. Mm -hmm. So then they put in a directive and all the boards went, all the boards went and they created regional systems. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're dealing with two different things here. My question is, why does Ontario believe that voluntary restructuring is going to work? What it never did in any of the other <laughs> and, and John, is your is your premise that we've already done the hospital restructuring well, I was, I was here, or not? I was here as ADM when we did also the commission directions. Right. That was part of the restructuring and uh -huh. acute. But we are far from restructuring the acute care system in Ontario. So let's just start from that. So are you calling for an end of hospital boards in Ontario, John? No, no. <laughs> And, and by oh, the way, next by week's the way, uh, presentation. Just, just wanted to check. I, by the way, I, I'm not opposed to this direction. I think this is the mm -hmm. right, anything we can do to integrate the system mm -hmm. is the right thing to move. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's not my point. Which of you would like this question? I right? just wanted, I just Brendan, wanted would, I'll, I'll start, you know. I'll let Brendan take that. Nature. Yeah, John, no, I, I love it. I think it's, I think this is a very interesting question. It's a, it's a great question. Um, and you know the, the 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 glass half full part of me says it's because we're now 15 years later. Smart people in Ontario have been chomping at the bit for over a decade to say how can we move this system forward. Um, they've you know we we have we have the learnings of those other like every, you know everybody's watched the other parts of Canada um, uh, agonize through these forced mergers where that it's followed by a decade of trying to do this. I'm not saying it's, go it's going to be like easy, but I do think, I, I, you know, I have, and I'm not, this is not a political statement, but I, from a change point of view, and what they've done is they've led with the legislation, which is crystal clear to all of us. We are going in this direction. We are going to achieve something different. Your first option is to figure it out yourselves and be advised if you're, uh, if you're not able to figure it out, or if you need help to figure it out, we will be here to help you figure it out. Yeah. I, I, think, like, I think that that is a really, really awesome thing for them to do, and, 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 and shame on us if we drag our heels and try to pretend that this is just gonna go away like you know, in three years. Like, I, 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 that's my personal feeling. I couldn't say it any better myself. I think that, that bottom up, kind of low rules, uh, iterative sort of model to start with, I think is really exciting. And I think that some, uh, some places will do really, really well with that. And there will be strugglers, and the strugglers will end up yeah. um, coming in in some way. Yeah. Okay, Frank Vassallo, I think his name? No, oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm Reza. Hey, Reza. Hey, Reza. Hi, I'm Reza Deber. Um, I'm going to ask a glass half empty question. <laughs> um, particularly since we're in sick kids. Mm -hmm. But how would the models deal with the fact that there's a very small number of very sick people who account for most of the health expenditures? Mm -hmm. And if I were setting up a voluntary health team, mm -hmm. I would simply not enroll any of those people mm -hmm. on the grounds that, oh, well, they're much too complex for us to deal with. Mm -hmm. And then what you'd find is they'd make a mint of money because most of their people don't use a lot of services, but they're being paid mm -hmm. for those people. Mm -hmm. And what would places like sick kids that have these very high intensity, high needs do? And I gather that BC put them into a special authority just for those. But mm -hmm. if you, is there a worry if you flow money through health teams that the high needs population will be avoided? Well, certainly um, in some of the conversations that I've had with, uh, with OHA and ministry colleagues around that very thing, I think, it is, uh, I think it is on the table as something that they're grappling with around how to construct a model that doesn't rob Peter to pay Paul. And what we don't want to have is we don't want to have 
OHT's form and realize that there's a really exceptional revenue stream that they really don't have to do anything for, but it helps them. And, and that it comes from somewhere else. Uh, you're very right, uh, that, that issue uh, was probably the primary issue uh, beyond simply the power equalization around why BC put those particular agencies in that separate bucket. Yeah. Um, uh, but it, it, there are, it's not perfect there either. And I think it'll be interesting to see how this evolves over time. And, 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 and let, let me just put a point on it before I pass to you, Brendan, because yep. uh, I think it's a really excellent question. Th there's been a, a naive, but po not naive, a political statement that there won't be geographic separation, which, you know, or geographic allocation of anything other than home care, which, <laughs> You know, particularly in the island yeah. situation. I mean, you, you you roughly speaking knew whether you we, were responsible. We had for a, a particular frat had a moat around us. Yes. It was hard for people to go. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and there were float planes and yeah. yeah. things like that. So, uh, is is it naive to to say you can't do this without having geographic boundaries? No, I I, I, I don't think it's naive. I think Razor, you, it's an excellent question. There's kind of two components to it. We were very conscious of market share and you know like and, and, and sort of and and inflow and outflow of, of and, and that was this this population need based formula in fact took that into account. Uh, so if we and we knew I, I knew that we actually delivered you know ninety seven percent of the services for the residents of Vancouver, of Victoria of Vancouver Island. Uh, the second part of it, though, is the valuation of the of these high end services, and that's where we actually will get into some challenge because um, there's also through this process, um, uh, you know, the, there's a bit of a reality around what you would like, like you know, what the high end organizations would like to have in terms of uh, you know offering these really high end services, and in the context of a big population model, what the system can afford, and there's a dynamic tension between that that top layer of resources that are taken and put into the provincial agency and all of the other agencies, and, and it's it's a tension, but it's uh, but it's manageable, I think, uh, yeah. Hi. <clears throat> Ron Noble, um, from your experience, when you look across the jurisdictions across the country, most of these have been led by larger institutions. So any advice or your experience where some of these Ontario health teams want to be driven by community primary care providers, uh, but they lack the infrastructure to drive this. So any advice to those that want to move further uh, upstream to get at um, primary care and community care delivery models? Well, I, from my perspective, I, I would just say that's where partnerships come in because I think the, the, the kind of harsh reality of some of the, the hard work that it's going to take to assemble these groups in Ontario health teams mean that they're, they're, you have to have some skin in the game and you have to be able to, to sort of invest, if you will, a lot of time and energy and resources into this. Uh, and I would say for the smaller agencies that don't have that, um, my recommendation would be find some partners that do and, and who think like you and try, try and, 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 and get that assembled. Uh, I know that um, as a hospital CEO, I'm incredibly sensitive to the fact that, um, that, that smaller partners may have the perception that somehow we're going to, we're trying to rule the world in these OHTs. And I think um, the reality, or at least my reality, is completely the opposite. Um, I see these OHTs as our hospital's salvation uh, because uh, we have too many people in the hospital right now that should never be in the hospital, that need to be out of hospital, and we know that if we work better with community, those people do not need to be in hospital. And we also know if we work better with community, particularly in the areas of mental health and, and in elder care, we can keep people out of hospital in the first place. That, to me, I think is the kind of trust and relationship that has to be present in these OHTs for them to be really highly effective. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Ron. I think it's a good question, and it really does come back to trust and relationship. I think that's why I was saying, you know, you, you need to start with some fair, like some specific areas of focus and mm -hmm. demonstrate, you know, that you can do stuff together and then build on that. It also, I, there are... 
There are lots of good models for uh, community-driven uh, change, mm -hmm. um, collective impact, for instance. There's, there, you know, that are that really are, you know, fundamentally different models of coming together. Where a large, you do need to have an anchor or a backbone organization that has the capacity to, you know, to, to you know, to support or facilitate to, you know, to convene. But you also have to have clarity around the, that that's not the same thing as then being the leader and the decision yeah. maker. So, yeah. so, so at Islander Fraser, where would you guys, uh, what, what would head office have looked like? How, bi how big is the non delivery head office? At Mine was an Audi A5 uh, um, with a stick shift. <laughs> It was awesome. I, yeah, I basically, it was driving the whole time. So, um, PHSA had 18,000 employees. Uh, the head office, obviously, there weren't 18,000 employees because quite, they also had delivery agencies, so quite a few of them were there. Uh, Fraser Health had a very large head office in Surrey. Uh, uh, it was designed as all this agile space. None of us had offices. Um, and uh, we had about over a thousand people at that uh, at that office space. And um, you know, the the one advantage that I have to say was great for me when I was a VP there is that if I wanted to talk to somebody uh, who was running some home health services, I could go down two floors and we could have a conversation, as opposed to everything always being not face to face. And I think that that gets back to that relationship part, knowing who to call to solve a problem like that. U unionized and pensioned. A very highly unionized, very owned and operated. So as, as, as uh, Brendan al alluded to, the, the long-term care, for example, was about a two-thirds, one-third split. Right. Uh, two-thirds uh, um, contracted, one-third owned and operated. Home health, though, is, is, has gone largely owned and operated, and particularly of late, mm -hmm. uh, which has some advantages and disadvantages, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. Frank. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Will. Uh, thank you for your insights, Arden and, and Dr. Kerr. Really appreciate them. Um, in the spirit of figuring out what we're going to do ourselves, uh, our oat that we're trying to uh, develop in uh, the Kentville, North Granville area, just south of Ottawa, is butting up against some large moving piece issues, such as information sharing. Mm -hmm. And primarily, our primary care docs are bringing that forward. Um, I'm wondering uh, what uh, did the BC government do to enable or facilitate information <laughs> sharing, whether it was changes in legislation or regulations? Uh, I'd like to hear. Thank you. Well, that'll be a fast question to answer, because uh, I don't think they're any further ahead. Uh, and they have really struggled as well uh, with large IT projects. The one thing I'm going to say that isn't necessarily an advantage of having big scale and scope is in IT. Um, it's really hard. Brendan absolutely knows a lot about this. The but experience is on my back. Yeah. They're kind of... <laughs> Can, it, can you just repeat that one run. more time slowly, that there, what you just said? Because I really want to just underscore that one so many times. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. It's just tough. everyone heard that she said there's no big scale and scope in IT, mm -hmm. and that you have to be careful to assume that there is. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think um, one of the other kind of really important learnings that aligns to this, uh, I think in every health system in the country, is that we've, uh, I think we're just starting to understand that there's been a missing partner and it's not a large IT system. It actually is a partner that can come into this and help us integrate information flows, inter in integrate data, yeah. turn that data towards patients, turn that data towards providers in a way that makes sense. I actually think that we're going to, we, we need to frame it as an integration partner, which is not the same thing as you know, a Cerner and all scripts, uh, or whatever. I'm not no, and no, I'm not. You know, no disrespect to those systems, but it's, but they're they're usually not sufficient for what we're talking. This is really talking about the ability to take really data sources and connect them in a way that makes sense for patients and for systems and and, from, and decision making. I think we're going to need to have to describe a partner in this who can actually do that with intention. Mm -hmm. I, I need you to push your button. We have time for two more. Hi, I'm Lisa Levin. I'm the CEO of Advantage Ontario, and we're a membership association representing 400 nonprofit long term care homes and seniors housing. And so um, I wanted to know what your thoughts were in terms of charitable donations that a lot of our members have, 
as well as we also have municipal homes. So I was very interested in the municipal discussion. And, you know, I've said to our members that, you know, you need to join the teams and come to the table with what it is that you need. And so you would want to say in there, obviously, this is not up for grabs, but the concern is that consensus will be made around the tables to say, well, you know, if you already have X amount of dollars, you don't need as much right. uh, from the pot as maybe another long-term care home who doesn't have right. these donations. I was just wondering if <laughs> any of these mm. issues came up in BC or... No, because we had no money. We had no money. <laughs> uh, no, nope. always have events. Yeah. That's a really good question, actually. We, we had pretty strict rules in BC about how you could use donations. So you could not use them for operating. You could only use them for capital. Uh, so that kind of... Yeah. Uh, you know, quash that whole thing. The, the, the other thing in BC, and, and like hold on to your seat if, if this is, if you don't know this, but we, we also had in most of the health authorities, these regional hospital districts, were, which were really the, the, reach, the municipal level of government, who for any capital project came to the table with 30% of the capital. Mm -hmm. So the notion of local share did not exist in the same way in British Columbia as it does here. It was, it was actually the local share was usually through a municipal taxation scheme that brought 30% of capital to the table. I'm just saying that's not relevant to your question. Th but it, th it's, through, through property taxes? Yeah. 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 And, and I should say that, that um, getting a capital project approved in BC, um, uh, there, there was a pre-negotiation, which was different for every single organization, around uh, how much a foundation would pony up to that. And that was based on their ability. So, yeah. you know, if you were a BC Children's Hospital, then there was a big, high huge, high expectation. If you were a Peace Arch Hospital, Hospital yeah. or Campbell River, there was a much lower expectation. And, and the foundations generally thrived or not? They thrived. Yeah, I so found, so. Yeah. so teddy bears and rainbows still, okay. They, and they were not accountable to the region and they were still state connected as a sole fundraiser. To the specialty to, organization. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let, let's come back, let's come back though, just pointed on the long-term care, care question and I'll add public mm -hmm. health again. Do, do you see those functions slash responsibilities moving to to the health teams, or how's that? What's going to happen? Go ahead. Well, I mean, I, you know, long term care. We, we, I don't know what the final answer is, but we can't. This, we won't. We won't be successful in trying to integrate the system if if our partners in long term care aren't fully at the table. Right. And because we need to, we because the converse of what John was talking about, in a way of, of of what we need to do, which is changing acute care, is actually how we support long term care, and you know, like to mm -hmm. to actually go through its own metamorphosis, so that we're you know we're able to support different high quality work there. I mean, I think that that's part of it. The public health, the only thing I'll add there is that, like, you know, the conversations change when you get to these more evolved models. When you're in community, you're not just talking about, you know, acute care. You're actually really talking about what are the health needs of this community? What are the things that are getting in the way of people, you know, achieving health? And our, you know, public health officers would, you know, when we, we our, our board meetings were multi-day events and they would happen all around our jurisdiction. And our, we, our public health would be part of that process where we would usually start the conversation in a community, not, not public health from a, from a, uh, uh, like a um, traditional public health way, but actually as part of a conversation around how do we frame health in this community? And they, we, and, and they were very integral to our thinking around how we understood our community, understood what intervention would support health. So I don't, I just, they need to be part of it somehow. I think eventually, I, I think it's gotta be, I, I hope long-term care soon, uh, and, and knowing that there's a lot of, um, you know, change and, you know, uncertainty in the public health realm right now. Uh, now is probably not the time, but at, but at some point, uh, you know, obviously that's a system we've been accustomed to working in and having all those players at the table. And, uh, and I think, you know, that would be ideal. Last question up top, yeah. Hi, it's Janet Daglish, Bayshore Healthcare. I just want to say as a provincial provider, we've been to at least 50 community engagement sessions over uh, the past couple of weeks uh, who meet weekly. And yeah. uh, I've got to say, I've never had so many collaborative discussions ever in my uh, 16, 17 years here in Ontario. So hats off uh, for uh, creating a change agenda. Uh, my question, I just want to leverage off the, the discussion around data. Um, Bashar, as an example, 
um, has been making some significant investments in um, uh, digital health ecosystem and driving innovative tools that can be used by patients and families. With the possibility of 30 to 50 OHTs and um, you know the need for flexibility to meet local population requirements, um, what, do you, what are your thoughts on how we can get there at the maturity stage around data architecture? <sighs> well, I'll, I'll start. I, um, so further to, I think, the, the previous comments that, that we both made around, um, you know, don't go big, go small. I, I, I honestly think um, this is a scenario where uh, we and we in healthcare are guilty of it is that sometimes we look for the most complicated solution to the simplest problem, and we should actually be looking for the simplest solution to the most complicated problem. And I think the simple solution here is there, there is actually, there is software out there that helps to link disparate programs. Um, the more complicated part is what do you do with all that data and how do you control it? And how do you make sure that the patient actually controls their own data? Um, that, I think, is the part that we're going to struggle with. But um, getting back to your question, I think that OHTs will have to start with who in the partnership has the most capacity to be able to move that partnership forward. We all are different in terms of where we land um, with, with having IT infrastructure. And, and I think some of what we do in, in, uh, uh, in our infrastructure right now is probably unnecessary and we need to discard it. Yeah. Um, some of it we don't use to its maximum capacity. So yeah. um, my view is, is that we have to just start really simple. I agree. I think we have actually some considerable resources in Ontario in terms of data uh, and data systems. What we haven't done well is connect the dots. Mm -hmm. And so I think the long-term vision needs to be about how do we do that? So how do we build off of what we have in a, in a smart way? Um, and, I, and I totally agree with, with Arden that I think that the emphasis needs to be more on how we connect you know, we connect things and, and try to create really elegant, simple solutions to what are kind of complex issues. Thank you very much. Um, as uh, we close for this morning, the next breakfast with the Chiefs is right away. Uh, we are on Tuesday uh, with Barb Collins at Humber River. There is free parking, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but we will be talking about uh, Barb's uh, hospital and uh, her digital program. Thank you. Have a good day.